world. These are the stories we're following for you today. First, Russia's foreign minister and his U.S. counterpart hold talks in Geneva amid rising tensions over Ukraine and NATO expansion. Moscow expects a written response to their concerns within a week. We'll get you a full report with analysis straight ahead. Plus, Belgium convicts the ringleader of a human smuggling group responsible for the deaths of 39 people who were discovered in the back of a truck in the U.K. We'll get you a full report on that. Then the Austrian parliament approves a mandatory vaccination order, becoming the first country in Europe to require that all adults get the COVID vaccine. We'll bring you all those details. All right, it's time to boost your news IQ. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken today in Geneva. The two discussed Moscow's recent request that NATO stop expanding towards Russia's borders, particularly into UK Ukraine. But the U.S. and European NATO states have repeatedly rejected that proposal. RT correspondent Peter Oliver takes a closer look at what actually came of that meeting. In Geneva, the Russian side calling them useful and constructive, the U.S. side frank and substantive, if you were going to sum it down to, to two words for each side. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, saying that the U.S. had agreed to respond to a list of Russia's security concerns in writing sometime in the next week. He also addressed a number of documents that were released on the eve of this meeting by the U.S. State Department that, um, among other things, concerned RT. Now, these type of State Department document uh, dumps, if you will, they're pretty much designed to make sure that when these type of events take place that the media are talking about what the U.S. State Department wants them to talk about and more importantly that they're talking about those things in the manner and the way in which the State Department wants them to talk about. What was interesting about these documents is they directly accuse RT and the news agency Sputnik of being agents of propaganda. The example given being that we have published or talked about issues and incidents involving neo-Nazi groups and far-right groups in Ukraine following on from 2014. Now RT and Sputnik are far from the only people to have talked about this. Many other media outlets as well as human rights Rights Watch as well, amongst other human rights organizations, have also touched on that. I asked the foreign minister what his take on that was, as well as the State Department's claim that there'd never been any threats from Ukraine towards Russia. These documents, which the U.S. State Department has, of course, prepared deliberately for today's meeting, are simply impossible to read. It's enough to scroll through a couple of random pages to be sure none of the provisions stand up to any critical analysis. In many cases, it is simply a lie. As for the statement that Ukraine poses no threat to Russia, well, I'd like to repeat that Russia has never, nowhere, not a single time officially threatened Ukraine. Meanwhile, President Zelensky, totally supported by the West, publicly declared that if any Ukrainian citizens consider themselves Russian, they should get out to Russia. And he called those who oppose Ukrainian state terrorism in Donbass, not humans, but species. So it's up for debate who threatens who. Well, Sergei Lavrov's press conference was open to press from anywhere around the world that wanted to attend. Um, the US media that were in attendance, they focused on when Russia was going to attack Ukraine. Why is Russia doing this now? Why do you feel that you need to make these troop deployments now when really the security posture of the US and NATO really hasn't changed over the past couple of years? I think the U.S. State Department should analyze the methods of CNN in regard to accuracy. You say we are going to attack Ukraine despite our multiple explanations that we won't. But saying this will happen, you then ask why now? When do we not attack? It's a strange question. Well, Sergei Lavrov's press conference was followed up with one from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, the U.S. Chief, Di Chief Diplomat, saying that the diplomatic route remained open to finding a solution to the tensions between Russia and the West right now. He said that he'd received assurances from Sergei Lavrov that Russia had no intention of invading Ukraine at this moment. He said he'd received those um, assurances in the past as well, but that if the actions of Russia didn't match up to that, then there would be a response from the United States and its allies, and that response would be swift, severe, and and united. Um, he said that there will be a response from Washington to those concerns that were voiced by um, Moscow, and that response will be coming in the next week. He also said that there's ways and means available to take the heat out of the current situation. Transparency, uh, confidence building measures, um, military exercises, arms control uh, agreements. These are all things that we've actually done in the past, uh, and that, if uh, addressed seriously, um, uh, can, I believe, uh, reduce tensions and address some of, uh, uh, some of the concerns. 
Well, the US Secretary of State also sketched out a potential timeline of where we could be going next. He said that once they've responded to Moscow, he would expect that there would be further meetings at the foreign ministerial level, perhaps here in Geneva, and if those meetings went well, that there could be another meeting between President Putin and President Biden, perhaps face-to-face, -face, perhaps here in Geneva, a repeat of what we saw last year, um, which took place in this Swiss city. What we have seen, though, is um, a continuation, a willingness to continue the dialogue over these ongoing tensions between Russia and the West. All right, here to discuss all of that and more, our panel today, former UK MP George Galloway and New York Times bestselling author and president of the Schlafly Eagles, Mr. Ed Martin. Uh, George, over to you first. Uh, the breaking news this morning, I'd like your take on uh, what to make of Olaf Scholz's rejection for, uh, from Joe Biden for a face-to-face -face meeting about Ukraine. It's quite extraordinary, really, the prime minister of a closely allied country, which is very close to where the action would be if a war breaks out over Ukraine. Uh, you would have thought that uh, that would have been the least that Germany was entitled to. Uh, he did get the benefit of <laughs> Mr. Blinken, or Blinking, as I like to call him. He looks Ivy League, but he's very much minor league. And uh, next to Lavrov, uh, that really, really showed. I think uh, that a summit between uh, the, never mind the German leader, but the Russian and American leaders is very much in order. Though the videos I've seen of President Biden this week, I'm not sure that you'd send him out for a loaf. <laughs> and I think you could probably agree with that. I know you're definitely laughing. Um, let's go over to Geneva with the two foreign ministers. Sergei Lavrov of Russia, Tony Blinken of the U.S. Are, they're meeting. They've ha they have met. It doesn't appear as though it was very productive. They both keep trying to say, oh, it was productive and we're talking things out. But, I mean, what was Blinken thinking going into all of this, Ed, seeing as Ukraine is not a member state of NATO? Well, Blinken is thinking to himself, why did I take this job? Uh, because Blinken because Blinken is really, he's not really doing a job. The policy is being run by Susan Rice and Jake Sullivan out of the White House. They were Hillary folks. They wanted the Ukraine in NATO five years ago. They're still on that track. That's what they're worried about. You know, Blinken is, you can see the body language. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to see the body language. There's Lavrov. He's confident. He's saying, what are you talking about? And Blinken is saying, um, in the past, we sometimes had a good conversation or an arms deal. That really helped us not be mad at each other. What's he talking about? And what he's talking about is during the press conference, Joe Biden, for you Days ago, actually made news saying we won't worry about an incursion. Not sure what that means, whether invasion. And literally, the State Department, I know this from sources, were scurrying, trying to figure out what to do. And in Kiev, they were saying, What's he talking about? This is an embarrassment. It gives me no pride, by the way, no encouragement to say we're being embarrassed. Here's the problem when you embarrass the world, it's one thing. When you put yourself in a position where you're playing wag the dog, you know, why the tail wagging the dog here about a war, you know, this is not a helpful thing. And we're, we're watching one side, in this case, Russia say, Here's what we're trying to accomplish. And our side is saying, Maybe Blinken can have a good conversation. And by the way, the Germans, they're saying, we're not going to meet with silly people. Why would we stand next to silly people? We'll just stay here and see how this plays out. Now, George, I mean, you've been at some high stakes talks over your time in Parliament. How did you read the talks in Geneva? Uh, exactly the way I just described. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know if you saw the Peter Sellers film, his last one, being there. Uh, uh, Blinken looked yeah. very much uh, like the Peter Sellers character, Chauncey Gardner, uh, Lavrov, big, powerful, confident, and above all, talking sense, while Blinken was talking nonsense. At one stage this week, Blinken demanded that Russia prove they're not going to invade <laughs> Ukraine, prove a negative if you will. Uh, and of course, their press officers at CNN were at that in Lavrov's press conference there. No, I agree with you, Manila. I don't think they went well. The fact that a written response uh, has been promised within a week uh, would seem to indicate uh, that some concessions will be made. But there's frankly only two concessions that Russia is really interested in. And that is a cast-armed, copper-bottomed, treaty guarantee uh, that the encroachment of NATO towards their borders will go no further and will not in any case, include Georgia and Ukraine. That has to be excluded as a possibility in writing. Yeah. Now, gentlemen, I'd like to switch gears a little bit here. Peter Oliver mentioned it in his report uh, to the State Department released last night of this report accusing this very network of, of the usual stuff, disinformation, one-sided bias, being propaganda, blah, blah, blah. They even cited this very show in question uh, in their report. <laughs> I'm actually kind of flattered that they obsessively watch this program. Um, Ed, I've known you for years. Have we yeah. ever steered your answers to any questions that I've ever asked in an interview? I mean, can you compare that to your experiences with the U.S. mainstream media? 
Well, look, I was on CNN for a while. I was a paid guy on CNN, and I can tell you the pressure to go along and get along at CNN, it was every day. And and, and look, the only thing I object to is I think Galloway will sometimes do disinformation, but that's because he's just a little clueless. I mean, that's not anything to do with any of this stuff. But but uh, look, I, no, I, what, this is a classic. This is classic. It's amateur hour. If you were running the state legislature in Missouri, where I was, you would put out a press release the night before. You know you're stumbling and fumbling, accusing somebody. Here's the problem. They weaponize this kind of crap. But so, sorry, press release. And what CNN and everyone will do is run a story on Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. And half the country will believe it because why? Big tech and big media are backed up by big government and they're forcing the message. It's really, it's it's a threat to the country, our nation, when you see big government do this kind of uh, political grandstanding in favor of a narrative. And I'll go back to this and simply finish with this. The neocons in this country are not in one party. They want war all the time. They make money off of it and they increase their power. And more war is better. And the drums of war are being beaten in this country in America, and there's very few voices saying, hold on, and your show and others on this network are some of those voices. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, George, I'll definitely let you respond <laughs> to uh, I had to get that dig in well, George. little dig there. Oh, yeah. But they say in this report that the viewers, as you know, speaking to what Ed just said, viewers of RT are basically anti-war, anti-imperialism, and are against <laughs> U.S. foreign policy of interventionism. If that's what the viewers are taking away from <laughs> this show or this network, I can't understand why that's a bad thing. I mean, what's your take, George? The poor fools wanting peace rather than war, uh, preferring <laughs> non-intervention to invasion and occupation. Don't fools have a right to a station that they can watch that they <laughs> might like? I never made it Ed, to the Missouri legislature, uh, but I was elected <laughs> six times to the British Parliament. I have six times sworn my allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen, and I can testify here, under oath if you like, that in more than a decade, and I'm on RT seven days a week, every week, for more than a decade. I have never, ever been asked by Russia or by anyone in the management at RT to say anything or not to say anything. There's not many broadcast outfits in the whole world where you could say that. And it turns out Ed Martin's in the same boat. Uh, I think yeah. that they should listen to us in stereo. This is hey, a hello. place where people like us can speak freely. And people, if they want, can watch us. Absolutely. The only thing, Manila, is less less Robert Burns quotes. That's the only thing I'm asking for. <laughs> I think I'll set you and George up for a conversation off air to make sure you don't quote all the, the usual people here. Uh, we'll leave that right there. Great talk. George Galloway and Ed thank Martin, you. thank you both. Thank you. Over to Austria now, the first European country to pass some sweeping vaccine mandates. Austria's parliament just passed a vaccine mandate that will require all adults to get the COVID-19 vaccine. That law goes into effect February 1st, but the bill must still pass the upper house and be signed then by the president. The government will begin routine checks of vaccination status starting mid-March. Now, speaking of vaccines, Russia's Sputnik V COVID vaccine is putting up a tough fight against the Omicron variant, which, according to the study, is 75 percent effective against the new variant. Protection against the COVID variant increases to 100 percent if supplemented with a Sputnik light booster just six months later. The developers announced the Sputnik V vax has two times higher virus neutralizing antibodies to the Omicron variant than the Pfizer. Now, Sputnik V has been authorized in 71 countries, Sputnik light now in 30. And a Belgian court convicted a man said to have been the leader of a human trafficking operation that led to the deaths of 39 people in the UK. We'll get you a full report coming up. And over at the Sports HQ, Steve Christako shows us highlights from a thrilling comeback victory over in EuroLeague. Now make sure you keep up with all the news beyond the headlines 24-7 by downloading the newly improved portable TV app. It is TV as it should be. Sit tight. We'll be right back. A Belgian court has just found a 45-year-old Vietnamese man guilty of human trafficking in connection with the deaths of 39 Vietnamese migrants whose bodies were found in a truck in Great Britain back in 2020. 31 men and 8 women were making their way to the UK from Southeast Asia in hopes of finding better jobs, better pay, but instead they met a brutal demise. RT's John Huddy has more. January is National Human Trafficking Prevention and Awareness Month, and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime warns that the ongoing pandemic is only making the threat of human trafficking worse worldwide, writing, quote, criminals are adjusting their business models to the new normal created by the pandemic, especially through the abuse of modern communications technologies. Most importantly, the pandemic has exacerbated and brought to the forefront the systemic and deeply entrenched economic and societal inequalities that are among the root causes of human trafficking. In Belgium, 18 people were convicted in connection with a human trafficking case in which 39 Vietnamese men and women were found dead in a truck back in 2020. 
The New York Times reports the 31 Vietnamese men and eight women were traveling along the so-called CO2 route, a perilous journey across the English Channel to Britain in poorly ventilated trucks or containers at the end of a 6,000-mile passage from Southeast Asia into Europe. The tragedy highlighted yet another example of the dark world of people smuggling and the international networks exploiting those seeking a better life in Europe. Italian police recently arrested 30 people accused of smuggling refugees into the European Union from Turkey on boats. The smugglers packed anywhere from 30 to 180 people on the vessels that were in danger of capsizing, according to officials. Those arrested are said to be part of a larger ring with at least 30 smuggling operations stretching across Italy, Albania and Greece. And the problem of human trafficking continues here in the United States as well. President Biden signed the National Action Plan to Combat Human Trafficking back in December. It's a three-year plan to fight human trafficking nationwide by, among other things, increasing the prosecution of traffickers, enhancing victim protections, and also preventing the crime from happening both within U.S. borders and abroad. For RT, John Huddy. Four and a half years after London's deadly Grenfell fire tragedy, fears of a repeat have now emerged with the public. That's amid plans to build a new high rise in that area with, yet again, just one fire escape for the residents. RT's Shadia Edwards Dashti has those details. Shadows of the Grenfell Tower, the tragedy that claimed the lives of 72. Plans are in place to build a new skyscraper, twice the height and just a few meters away. Despite the public inquiry concluding the safety policy of the Grenfell Tower failed, this new building is set to adhere to that failed policy, including the requirement for just a single escape staircase. We already know that single staircase uh, staircases are very difficult to use for firefighting and escape at the same time. The whole situation is that the area becomes very crowded. You had to have uh, escape routes on the exterior of the building because then they could be naturally ventilated. The proposed high-rise is designed to accommodate hundreds of households and would adopt similar policy. Nabil Chuker lost five members of his family on the 14th of June 2017 and that night residents were told to stay put. I'm very concerned the fact that uh, it's a one staircase. Um, stay put is also this is going to include stay put. Why haven't they still learnt or from the previous? You know, do we want to go straight into planning and make it and then learn from our mistakes? We shouldn't do that. The government is currently reviewing the provision of escape routes and building regulations, while the local council insists resident safety comes first. The safety of our residents is our number one priority. We take a tough line with developers to ensure that anything they build is fully compliant with all safety and other regulations as a minimum, and that local people are fully consulted. We are aware of this development and we will be providing a response to the planning consultation. While new homes can no longer be clad in combustible material, like that which caused flames to shoot up the Grenfell Tower, the government is still yet to remove cladding from thousands of tower blocks in the UK, and unlikely to do so before 2025. For survivors and the bereaved, erecting another high-rise building while lessons haven't been learnt is unforgivable. We still haven't finished with the inquiry for, for their proposal to be given, or even new laws or recommendations or whatever it is. It's like as if we're carrying on, uh, profits before lives and this can't happen. It, when will they ever learn? It's still nothing has been learned. They say lightning doesn't strike twice, but is this really the place to build a tower and with questionable safety precautions as the community is still in mourning and awaiting justice? Shadi Edward Stashdi, RT, London. And TV and films and even sports will soon be going zero gravity. Space Entertainment Enterprise is planning to launch a TV and film studio as well as a sports arena in space. That launch is scheduled for late 2024. The company, co-founded by the two co-producers of Hollywood actor Tom Cruise's upcoming space movie, will build a space station module that accommodates production, recording, and broadcasting. Now, this comes several months after a Russian crew filmed the first ever movie in space. All right, let's head over now to Steve Christakos at the Sports HQ for a thrilling comeback on the court for at least one team in EuroLeague. Yes, Manila, I'm still thinking about the sports arena in space, though, but we'll get back to that. Back on track with round 22 action, where Fenerbahce played host to 18th place Algiers Countess. The Lithuanian squad with just three wins on the season, they put up quite a fight, trying to play spoiler, making the trip to Istanbul, where Fenerbahce...